Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello. Hello. Hey, Fred. How are you? Fine, fine. How are you? I'm good. So you've got lots of people coming. Well, I've heard that story before. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you have a lot of people coming. Yeah. So, and this um, is great, too, because it's you know, they must have heard about it too, maybe from the first people who went. So well, I have a I have a mailing list, so I sent a lot of people. I sent a lot out to the mailing list. So, uh, but they, uh, the ones I sent out wouldn't wouldn't show up on the event bright. In the event bright, exactly. So we'll see how many of those people show. I don't know because. You know, it's just people on my regular. Uh, yeah. For my, it's my foodie, my foodie uh, yeah. Saturday night list. So. Good. But you never Have you know. Been more from Servas now, on your foodie thing. Can you? Yeah, talk? I mean the other night, uh, I don't know where the couch surfing people went. I think they had something else going on, so they weren't there. Well, a couple of people from couch surfing were there, but there was a whole bunch of Servas people. Good. 
Canadians. Canadian. There's a woman in Canada that, I don't know how to describe her, became a fan and she sort of- <laughs> Told her friend. The word, yeah, passed the word around of her friends. Yeah. Well, Sylvia, I here she is speaking of- Okay, the Canadian lady. Yeah. So, and I think it's, uh, this is something we'll continue because even we all like to travel but it's going to be a while before we do that. Okay. Hi, Sylvia. Hello, Sylvia. <laughs> You're muted. Yeah. Um, so um, I sent it, this to quite a few Canada service members. So, Good. Uh, so here's hoping. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying to Rennie, are, were your ears burning? Because I was just saying you were, you're the one that, uh, Brought all the Canadians. Right. Yeah. And they're yeah. so nice. The Canadians are so nice and well behaved, too. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm not sure about that. The California but... gang's a little rowdy, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> well, all the more exciting, you know? Yeah, it's nice. It's a nice mix. Yeah. Now, the couch surfing's a, a younger crowd, hmm. and they're fun. and. I hang out with them a lot, a lot of different activities. So, you know, we become friends. If you're mm -hmm. if you're on three several times a week with sort of the same people, pretty soon you know who they are and you know mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Yeah, you start to have relationships. So, yeah, it's nice. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, is, is, Fred, is that your home in the background? No, this is a simulated background. Oh, okay. Virtual. It's called a virtual background. Uh -huh. And. Uh, he has some very I, interesting ones. Yeah, I have a bunch of them. This is uh, <laughs> this is one of my kind of standard ones, but I have a couple boat ones and I have kind of an artsy one. Actually, it's artsy tonight. I should put one of my artsy ones up. <laughs> Art night, at least for a while. It's a little too busy, but yeah. it's okay. Where are you in Canada, Sylvia? Um, right now, I'm in Victoria, British oh. Columbia, but uh, for the winter, but I actually live in Edmonton in the summer. So okay. how about you? Uh, well, I'm in Maui. Oh, wow. But originally from Chicago, so I know bad weather. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why we escaped the West Coast. <laughs> Victoria is very nice. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking about it. I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to rename myself with uh, my yeah. first name and where I'm coming from. It yeah. helps when people have a little idea where people are com where where people are. They don't have to keep asking where are you coming from. Okay. So you click on the little three dots in your picture. Okay, I can do that. the The problem is that sometimes it doesn't. Uh, be, well, yeah, sometimes. Well, good. It did the whole thing. Sometimes you have to leave off your last name. Yeah. Yeah. I usually just put my first name. Nobody really remembers last names anyway. But yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, I've been kind of practicing a little bit today. It's a little. Uh, uh, you know, I don't do presentations too often. Usually, I teach a class. And on Saturdays, I show a movie. So I normally don't use the presentation software. So I kind of had to learn that a little bit. And then there was a few other little glitches. So, mm -hmm. but I had, I ate and had a half a glass of wine. So <laughs> my presentation anxiety has lessened a little bit. <laughs> Tell us about your background, Fred. This yeah, this is one of my this is one of my uh, art pieces that I drew. Oh, and uh, it was drawn on an iPad Pro, which is a big iPad that I have, using Apple Pencil Two, and a piece of software called Procreate, which is one of the top uh, art software for drawing. The good news is it only costs like. Ten dollars or something. It's very oh. inexpensive, but it's very oh, powerful. Beautiful, beautiful. Very powerful. Yeah. So I've got hundreds, not hundreds, but I got way lots of these. <laughs> I used to do them on 
paper with, uh, you know, with colored ink and pencils and pens and all that. But now I've switched over to all digital. Mm -hmm. Okay, Penny is connecting. Welcome, Penny. How are you? Thank you. Yeah, we're having a little... I'm well, and you? Yeah, fine, fine. We're having a little uh, pre-presentation chit-chat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Welcome, I'm glad you're here. Okay, Fred, do you want to you make me co-host? Background. I yeah, so I can pay yeah, excuse me for yeah, yeah, excuse me for a moment. I'm yeah. going to uh, sure. I'm going to make uh, And Penny, you look like you're there with somebody, but we can just see a shoulder. <laughs> this is my longtime partner husband Mark, and he's coming Hi, along for the ride. Good. Is he shy or is he just sitting over there like he likes to sit there? I don't know why he's sitting over there. That's we only, I don't know. We only uh, see him I'm from his here. nose. I, I move. The the screen is splitting his oh. face right down the middle. Here we yeah. Go. <laughs> I get oh. How's that? Oh, that's better. That's oh. better. Okay. That's that's better. 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 Great. Okay. He's got better. a good face. Yeah. yeah, and where are you folks from? Penny, where are you from? Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh. Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah. 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 That, that's where Joanne's from. Yeah. And my sister went to school there. But yeah, that's been a long At time ago. And I'm sure you wouldn't know her. Well, <laughs> but she liked it. Yeah. Well, I went to school there a long time ago as well. Yes. <laughs> And uh, we haven't really done much work with Servas in some time now, but when but we have great memories of the times that we did, the places that we traveled. We never hosted, but we 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 used it. We were guests in several places that were quite memorable. Okay. Yeah, we all have great memories. I've told the story before that my. But I want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm really interested in Diego Rivera. You know, if you've seen in one Diego Rivera mural, in my opinion, you have to see more. And I- and Which, kind which of, one did you one. see? Yeah, which one did you, you see? You know, I saw the ones in Mexico City, but the best one was in Detroit. The Who knew that he was there? Uh, not only that, he has like 27 murals in the Detroit Institute of Art. Oh, yeah. They have to go to Detroit now. Exactly. It's a huge, huge collection. Yeah. It's a little closer than Mexico City. And we happened to go there on a great day when we visited. Uh, there was a docent who just really had a lot to tell us about the murals. And we were entranced for at least an hour. And uh, well, he's just, a, yeah, he's somebody to know. He's, he's somebody to know. Yeah, so and I'll talk, I'm gonna, I'm Go sorry. So, yeah, your audio is a little choppy. So I, we oh, don't, okay. you know, some, let me, let me well, well the, sometimes it's just your uh, internet connection. Sometimes it's just a little, well, okay. That, I, I mean, wouldn't be surprised. If yeah, I there's not much you could do about it. Uh, just is what it is. Tonight. Yeah. So who else is here? Well, uh, is this is, yeah, yeah, they can introduce themselves. Yeah. Sylvia. Okay. Okay, I, Sylvia, I'm, um, I, I'm from Servas Canada. I've been a board member. Oh. I, I'm um, an interviewer. I'm the host coordinator for Northern Alberta and, um, yeah, um, what a forty-year service um, wow. and oh, host wow. And, wow. and and member and a traveler. Yeah. And I'm Renee. I am a great, host great, 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 and a traveler. Our very best travel experiences have been through Servas. Uh, when my son was twelve, we did a round the world trip. I took a sabbatical, we took a sabbatical. And in Europe, just in Europe, we were there three months. 
we stayed with 23 different families, Servas families. And that was 2002, wow. 2003. Wow. And I'm wow, still wow. in contact with some of them. Mm -hmm. Just, But in the States too, we've been, we've had incredible experiences traveling. Our first guests were very awesome and they were from Canada. They came with cheese and wine and we knew we were going to like hosting right away. <laughs> yeah, 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 that sounds great. Yeah. yeah, 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 I've been a member off and on for, oh, I'm from the, since the 80s, even though uh, I was an expat in Mexico for almost 20 years, yeah. didn't have too much service uh, going on uh, while I was there, but the first person I, the first time I went there originally, I stayed with the Servas host. And she said, uh, well, I'm going to Texas. I have to take care of some business. Would you like to house sit for me for a month or so? And I said, yeah. Mm. So that's how that kind of started out. So I house sit in a real nice house right in the middle of town. And uh, also my oldest, dearest friend, who's from originally from Israel, uh, was a serv was one of my service guests many many years ago, and we've been friends all these years since 1984, I think. Wow! So you know you wow. have some law. You know, there's some people you meet, and you know you're just kind of passing by, and others you, like Renee said, you have relationships with, you know, because you have something in common, or you just hit it off, or whatever reasons. And some people. Uh, I'm just thinking of a couple that yeah. live, a, live yeah. up in, in Healdsburg in the wine country in California. And uh, I stayed with them. I was traveling in my yeah. RV, in my RV on a 18 month trip around the United States. And they, uh, they had some service people from Italy they met. I don't know who stayed with whom, but then over the years they just became friends and they would just visit each other and sometimes do home exchanges. Mm -hmm. They go stay in their friend's place in Italy and their friends would come to Healdsburg and wine country and, you know, do a house swap. So you know, all kinds of things uh, evolve out of that sometimes. Yeah. 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 So it is a great organization. Yeah. And uh, I guess, uh, well, like you say, there's not much traveling going on these days, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. uh, no. I was I was on the Servas Canada board for 17 years, and you know it's just, and uh, we meet personally every three years, and so I'm still in close contact with most of them, and they've become really good friends, you know, so mm -hmm. from oh, all yeah. across Canada. Yeah. 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 Here, yeah. Comes well, here comes Helen. Helen. So um, if you. I can co-host too if you need more people to let, or are you okay? Well, I think we're okay, but I'm going to make you a co-host anyway, and just who knows, if it never hurts to have more than one, so okay. I'll because, do that right now. Because we're supposed okay. to have oh. so many people. Yeah. So. Okay, th yeah, this is my friend, uh, Alan Anders, yeah, and, and she lives in San Jose. Hi, Alan. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Okay. I'm glad I got on. I finally got the link and got on. So okay. Fred, yeah. from Canada, I entered, I invited Alan, who lives in San Jose. <laughs> oh, terrific. Yeah. Thanks, she Alan. Was, uh, she was an exchange teacher um, up here in Alberta many years ago, and we became friends since then. So, <laughs> well, welcome, Alan. I'm uh, Fred. And uh, Ellen in San Jose. OK. Yeah. Great. And here's Jean. I recognize Jean from a previous meeting. Yeah, I'm going back to the kitchen to continue cooking dinner. <laughs> and you're in California. You're in California, aren't you, Jean? Yes, I am. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I don't want to go into too much detail because you know we're going to get a whole bunch of people here, and then I'm going to have to sort of go through my introduction and everything. So I'm sort of. Uh, 
not going into too much uh, detail about tonight. But having, having said that, I do have a little thing that I'll tell people and it's kind of, uh, I'll put it in the category of last minute news. Welcome, Sandy. Hello. Where are you coming from, Sandy? I am coming from Northern Minnesota. Oh. Mm -hmm. Are you there in California? In, yeah, I'm in Seal Beach, California where it's about 75 degrees. Well, come on over here. We're expecting <laughs> six, in, six inches of snow tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> careful, 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 Michelle. Okay, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you know how to re do you know how to rename yourself, Sandy? Oh no. Uh no. Why? Well if you put your if you well, we like to have see uh, we like to have next to your name where you're coming from because we get a bunch of people. Oh so in your square, if you put your mouse over your square where your picture is, there's three little dots. You click on that and you'll see a thing that says rename. Okay, hang on one sec. Yeah, and then just put Sandy, Minnesota, or something like that. Okay, just a sec here. Okay. Oh. All right. Then, yeah, you know what? Can I call you back? I, uh, I'm in a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I will, and thanks. I shouldn't have taken that. Uh, that so, no, okay, the three little dots, got them. Yeah, That's and then you can, and you can just say Sandy, <laughs> Minnesota. Okay. And here's so, Gwen. Then, yeah. Sandy C. And then what, my Deer River, Minnesota? Yeah. And there's Gwyneth and Dan. Welcome. Oh, uh, hello there. Hello. Hi. <laughs> where, where are you coming from? British Columbia, uh, the Okanagan Valley. Oh, great. Yeah. And there's some wine country, wine country up there. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. We have yes. those. <laughs> More than we can take in one night for sure. Uh, yeah, hi, Gwyneth and, hi, Gwyneth and Dan. <laughs> hi. hi. I, I just hi? see ourselves. Is that what we're supposed to do? Uh, no, you're, uh, you're, uh, if you go up into your upper right hand, are you, what kind of device are you on? I'm on a Mac. And uh, yeah, if you, go up in, you go up in the right hand corner of the, uh, of the Zoom meeting, there's a thing that says view. Okay. I you, I'm still Click trying to explain. You, you want to be in gallery view. Right. And nothing says gallery view. We we just click on that. Click on the view. View the button, view. and there's two views there's speaker or gallery. Ah. Well. And if you're just seeing yourself, you're in speaker view or probably. Okay. I tell you what, maybe I should rephone. Okay. Uh, no, it, just click on the view. Uh, we don't it, have it yet. What's view? Well, put your, you have to put your mouse up there for maybe for it to actually show up. Um, we still have a little circle. Are you on an with, iPad or a Mac? An iPad. Okay, so that's the, on the iPad, it's over on the left hand side up toward the left corner. There's uh, two choices. There's again, gallery view, speaker view. It's on the left on the upper left hand side. Hi Renee. Hey, so Renee. click on the view. Okay. Hi Joseph. Yeah. Hello Joseph. Hey. Welcome. We are. Yeah. There's Hi. David and Andrea. Uh, uh, and try to get it. Oh so far just David. Andrea is behind me I think. Okay. Is that right here? Yeah, on the iPad, it's in the upper kind of upper left portion there. That. Yeah, okay. and you just click on it, and it's either speaker view or gallery view. That's the two choices. Uh, hey, Pat, what is this event about? This is uh, we're going to I'm going to do a presentation about a, a Diego Rivera mural. Ooh, that will be fun. I will love that. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming. And uh, we're, we're gonna, I'll, I'll give a, a full introduction once we, uh, we're, we're gonna wait a while. I mean, it's, uh, it's better to kind of start a little later than to start and have people keep coming into the meeting and, and 
kind of in the middle of it. So you have four minutes to go. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I sort of tea. I have a class on uh, Mondays. I tease my student. The the last person arriving gets a booby gets a booby prize. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all right, there's a or. My friend Orr, hello Orr, he's here, he's probably cooking. Good day, yes I actually am. <laughs> yeah. And as I've mentioned, uh, when I send out when I send out this invitation, uh, I never know what kind of experience people have with, uh, with Zoom. So I've told people, look, you can, if you're a little shy or something, or you're eating dinner, you can, Turn off your video and your audio, but you can still see, you can still hear what's going on. People have a tendency to think, oh, if I turn off my video and my audio, I won't be able to see or hear anything. But when you turn off your video and your audio, we just don't see or hear you, but you can see and hear us. Oh, good God. <laughs> so that's handy because, you know, maybe you're in the kitchen... Uh, uh, you know, working on dinner or something. And if you've got a tablet or an iPad or something like that, you can sit it on the table or on the counter and you can still listen to what's going on while, while we don't hear you rattling the pots and pans. So, Fred, what do you teach? I teach an iPad class, actually. Apple iPad oh. class, yeah. What class? An Apple iPad class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's become very popular uh, these days for all the obvious reasons. They're really great devices, and uh, you can the average person can do everything they need to do with the iPad. But Gwyneth and Dan still can you see? Can you see everybody? Turn it back on. We, we can't oh, see anything except ourselves. The one that Rockefeller order destroyed. Well, I think when you start, Fred, we'll just mute everyone so we don't get background. Well, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that, yeah I'll, I'll explain that. So okay. you hear what's going on with, uh, well, we, yeah, I will mute everybody when I do the presentation, but. What happens with the with, what happens with Zoom is if you're not muted, when your dog barks or the phone rings, we all hear it. If you're having a argument with your partner, we hear it. So uh, it's good to keep yourself muted, and then when you get ready to speak, you unmute yourself. And uh, the other thing that happens, like if I'm doing my presentation and we're looking at this beautiful mural and you're not muted and your dog barks, your, your dog won't get blamed, but your picture will suddenly come up in the screen instead of the bureau mural, beautiful mural, we'll see you. And everybody will know, uh-oh, it was me that did that. My phone rang, you know, I sneezed or whatever. And if you aren't muted, then the, the, the computer, what it does is whoever is speaking their picture comes up on the screen. So that's why when when I get when I start to make the presentation, I'll mute everybody so that won't happen. And then after after that, then uh, I'll I'll ask everybody to unmute themselves and then we can have question question and answers. So if you have questions, you just write them down during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll never get finished. We'll be here forever. So if you have a question about something, you write it down. And then when we get to Q&A, uh, we can talk about it. And we can stick around for a long time. Some people, they just want to, you know, when that's over, they're ready to go do something else. But can he see her? I, oh, Sylvia. <laughs> We're here finally. So, no, um, I was just going to say, I might be interested in your iPad class, so you can tell me about it. And yes, also, I, I probably will have too. to leave about 6.30, so I just okay. want to know that. Okay. All right, that's fine. Yeah, you, okay. don't have, you don't have to have permission to leave. 
Uh, there's just down there in the bottom right hand corner, okay. is there just the end button. And if you have to leave, don't, you don't have to ask, you just leave. For, you don't have to yeah. have any excuses. There's Howard, there's Jen. Uh, hey, Ben. Yeah. 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 Sylvia, so, where's Alan? No. <laughs> okay, Gwyneth, Gwyneth, we can hear. Everybody, everybody hears you talking <laughs> to Sylvia. <laughs> I thought I could whisper. No, we hear you when you're whispering. We can okay. hear you when you're in the other room whispering, even. All right. Well, we're getting a good uh, good crowd here. We're up to 32 people. Okay. And people are still coming. That's, where we That's right, Fred. This is the party event. <laughs> yeah. Parties on Saturday night, which I will... Uh, before we're finished, remind me, I will I will post in the chat what Howard calls is the big Saturday night party. Hey, Ben. Which is a, a thing I do on Saturday nights called foodie film travel. It's so the I'll, very VIP event with Fred. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll post it in the chat before we're over, before we're finished. Can I ask you a question? All right. Okay, now we're getting we're, we're getting to the point now where we got a lot of people. So I'm going to acknowledge somebody. Like Joseph's got his hand up. Were you going to say huh? something, Joseph? Well, but I just have um to go to um bed. That's okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Let's just say you don't need permission. If you have to leave, you just click in and you'll leave the meeting. Fine. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. All righty. So, uh, yeah, so we have a, a lot of people here are Servos people, but we have a couple of couch surfers. Howard of Los Angeles is a couch surfer. Jen, the infamous Jen from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, she's a couch surfer and, an, and Servos. So she she kind of has dual membership like me. And host a sister and be welcome because yeah. why have one when you can have four? Yeah, and she was recently on. Well, you, and she has a podcast. My face is cut off. So, oh, four people. busy woman. Busy woman. She's a movie star. <laughs> okay, so I got to look over on the other page here and see how. Oh my gosh, we got tons of people here. I, I have a big monitor, a, tw a 32 inch monitor, so I can see 25 people at a time, but. Once it goes over 25, I have to go to a second screen to, to see the uh, overflow. Okay, great. Yeah, well, uh, this is wonderful because uh, sometimes when we do these events, you never know who's gonna show up. Like I belong to a bocce ball group in my community and then when the uh, when the uh, COVID shutdown came along, we weren't playing bocce ball. We had like a hundred people on the mailing list. And I said to one of the board members, oh, let's, uh, yeah, let's have a big uh, get together of all the bocce players. Okay, so we sent out like a hundred people, three people showed up. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we don't want to, we just want to play bocce ball. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you never know until the, that time comes of who's going to show up. So that's why it's really gratifying to see uh, see so many people uh, come to an event. All right, we're up to 37. Okay. Well, the, the original story was that uh, when uh, Joanne approached me to do this presentation, she says, well, how many people would you like to limit it to? And I said, well, how about 50? That's pl way plenty. She said, okay. And then she wrote back to me a couple weeks later and she said, we sold out in 50. And I said, okay, make it 100. Because when you got 50 signed up, you're only going to get like 12. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, but all right, we're up to 40. So that's good. All right, where's, let's see, we're at 536. 
Well, because people are still coming in, we're going to wait a little bit. I'll try not to make this uh, presentation, you know, go forever and ever. But what happens at these get togethers is uh, you could what happens after the presentation, then we all sit around and talk. Like you say, if you're finished with that and it's late where you live, you can just exit. But as Howard can testify to, sometimes we go on to the wee hours of the morning. As long as there's somebody there that wants to stay up and talk on something, we keep on going. So you just oh let your conscience be your guide. You wonder if oh my has already has a problem. Okay. All right. Minute man. All right. So let's see. We've got 40. And let's give it a couple more minutes. And I think we're getting up. I think we're getting up to the maximum now. Not maximum, but okay. Who waits for me? All right, who's ever you're talking, we're, we're hearing you talk. If you have a partner and you're talking to each other, unless you're muted, we can hear you. It's okay, we, but we just don't want you to turn into the Bickersons or something. Unless you're talking about all your secrets in case, in that case, please speak a little bit louder. Yeah, if you have your, you're talking about your bank account, make sure you say the, the number so we can write it down. <laughs> Succinctly. <laughs> All right. Okay, we just got one more. All right, we're up to 41. So, okay, I think I'll kind of get started here. And uh, Renee and uh, Sylvia are going to be the co host. So, their job will be to admit people that come in after I've started the presentation because. I'm not going to be able to see everybody, and uh, like you say, I'm, I will mute everybody, and then I'll start with the presentation, and then after the presentation, uh, then we'll go to Q&A, and I'll ask everybody uh, to, well, it's just like if you went to any big group, if you're going to have a convert, you know, I mean, it's kind of think of a, you know, the lecturers, lecturer standing up there on the stage, and you're in the audience, everybody's nice and quiet. When he gets finished, he says, uh, he or she says, any questions? And of course, everybody raises their hand. They don't all just start shouting out their question. Yeah. So that's kind of the way we do it too. It's just normal mm -hmm. stuff. There's all kinds of digital ways to raise your hand, but by and large, we just, when that time comes, you just kind of stick your hand up and wave and we can notice it. And uh, because we have more than one screen, Renee and Sylvia will be kind of looking at the screen and they're going to say, hey, uh, you know, Joe, Joe Schmo over on uh, page two, he's got his hand up. So that way we can acknowledge uh, people if they want, if they have a question. Okay, we're up to 43 here. Okay, let's see if I can get all my stuff together here. All right. You'll probably hear me talking to myself a little bit as I walk myself through this. So I go to participants and I say uh, mute all. That's when I start with that. And then I go over here to my presentation. And I open that. And then I go over here to share screen. Okay, can you see that? Thumbs up. Okay, and you can hear me? Thumbs up? Okay, so this is, uh, this is not the entire mural. This is just kind of a little placeholder while I do some introductory uh, information uh, before we get into the whole thing. So just for the record, 
Uh, let me check here. Can you see up in the corner where they were recording or not? Co-host. Okay, Howard says we're recording. So I'm going to record this because it makes it much easier when somebody didn't get here and they say, oh, I'd like to see that. Do you have a recording? Now, if you're shy and you don't want your picture, currently I can only see Sylvia and Howard and Alan. So, but if you want, if you don't want your picture to show in the recording, you could just go to your uh, turn off your video and then that way we won't see who we won't see your picture and you'll still be able to see and hear what's going on so this is just this isn't even the whole mural this is just a little snippet of it but i'm just going to use it for a background while i give an introduction here okay so to start with i'm not an academic and i'm not a professional presenter and uh I developed my interest in Diego Rivera while I lived as an expatriate in Mexico for about 17 years. And my partner at the time was a sculptor and we made frequent trips to Mexico City to pick up her finished bronze sculptures at our foundry. And so we made lots of trips to Mexico City and over the years, I've been to Frida's house, I've been to Trotsky's house, I've been to Diego's studio. There's a small museum of his pre-Columbian art collection. And also the town I lived in, kind of artsy fartsy San Miguel de Allende is in the state of Guanajuato. And Diego Rivera was born in the city of Guanajuato. So I've actually been to his, to his, uh, the, his home where he was born. There's a little museum there. So that's kind of my background. Uh, uh, about this kind of stuff. Also, uh, through a friend of mine, I met a woman named Masha Zakheim, who lives lived in San Francisco. She's no longer with us, but <clears throat> her father was involved in a WPA project in doing frescoes in Coit Tower. So anybody that's familiar with San Francisco know and heard of Coit Tower. And she wrote a definitive history, a book about Coit Tower. And in Coit Tower, there was a stairwell that was long since closed to the public, I guess for safety reasons or something. But because I was a friend of hers, she took me up to see those special uh, frescoes in that stairway. And while we were talking about it, and she said, yeah, they, these people were uh, they were influenced by Diego Rivera. I said, well, I heard there's other uh, murals of Diego Rivera. One of them is in the uh, city club of San Francisco, but it, it's a private club. And she says, oh, well, I'm an honorary member of that club. We can go there and have lunch and I can take you to see that mural. And that one's called the Allegory of California. So I did get to go and see that that Diego uh, mural while I was there. So kind of the history of this mural is, <clears throat> it was created in 1940 and they had a thing there called the Golden, Golden Gate Exposition and the fellow that organized it, it was done on uh, Treasure Island and basically had, they had artists kind of in resident doing their art. And Diego was there doing this mural. Now, usually a mural, and I'll get into the details because one of the things we want to talk about tonight is to, to distinguish a fresco from a mural. I mean, all, all frescoes are murals, but not all murals are fresco. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. And we'll, we'll even look at a, a small video. <clears throat> so, so what he did was he created this mural in, uh, in these kind of, uh, the way, best way I can describe it, think of a, think of these uh, on, uh, pans you put in your onion, uh, in your oven, you know, sheet pan, it's got a little rim around it, it's aluminum fits in the oven. Well, what he did is he did his mural in giant versions of that that weighed tons. 
Okay, somebody's drawing on my screen. Okay, so please don't, I don't know what happened there. Maybe it's me, maybe I'm drawing on my own screen. Anyway, so what he did is he did this mural in a, in a few sections. And one of the reasons was so it would be portable because it was the idea with this mural is it was going to be installed in what later became uh, San Francisco City College. And this architect was going to build us, uh, 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 you know, a facility there, a special room or something. But because of the war, it never happened. So after this exhibit, that, that uh, mural in pieces came and was stored for a while, but eventually I think in the 60s or something was actually installed and then it was there for many years. But the mural, in, it's created on 10 steel frames and that's what allows it to be moved and relocated. And the mural is 22 feet high and 74 feet wide. So it's giant. And it makes it hard to kind of show it on a small screen because for all the obvious reasons. And here you're not even, this picture I'm showing you now is not even the whole mural, but we're gonna look at it piece by piece. So we'll get a little bit closer shot at it. And it's the single, largest single standing mural created by Rivera. He did, he created some others that were, were also uh, single standing, but most of them were conventional uh, frescoes, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. So basically, what's the difference? What kind of murals are there? Well, murals, we kind of think of murals as these large paintings kind of on the side of a wall someplace. So we've all seen them, you know, I was in Chile and Valparaiso, Chile, there was a bunch of them all over town. There were nice paintings, you know, on the sides of buildings. Those, uh, generally speaking, that's just somebody that's taking conventional kinds of paints and painting quite nicely, but painting a picture on the side of a wall. What happens with a fresco is that, and you're gonna see it in a, you're gonna see a video here in a moment. A fresco is painting on wet plaster. And what happens in that, when you do that, there's a, a chemical reaction takes place where the pigments that are used in the painting become a literally become part of the wall. And I'm gonna show you examples. Uh, well, we're obviously we're gonna see Diego's mural, but I'm also gonna show you some samples of uh, Michelangelo's famous, the Sistine Chapel where I just visited it recently. And uh, it's a good example of uh, a fresco. And that's where Diego, who went at a rather young age, he was a child prodigy and he was sent to Europe and he kind of studied uh, fresco and stuff and that's where he really got interested. He was a, he was a terrific artist in his, in his own right and he did a lot of art that wasn't fresco but he kind of found his niche with fresco. So I'm gonna go here Hopefully it can make this thing work. It's known that his basic approach was a standard technique called Buon Fresco, which can is still taught at places like this International Conservation Organization in Rome. The chief conservator is Paul Schwartzbaum, now with the Guggenheim Museum. He explains what has been learned from the restoration about Michelangelo's technique. We're going to try and make a reproduction, if you will, to recreate the, the working technique of Michelangelo, the way he painted the frescoes of the Sistine ceiling. Um, we're going to use the same materials, and we're going to try as best we can to, we're not Michelangelo, but to, to recreate uh, his working technique. 
The materials that you see on, on the floor, we know from analysis, these are the materials that Michelangelo used to make his plaster. The plaster is made from lime, water, and a brown volcanic ash called pozzolana. These are mixed into a smooth violet-colored paste. The plaster is applied to a surface prepared the day before called the oricchio. This fresh wet layer, the intonico, is applied just before painting. The word fresco in Italian means fresh. And what it means is that we're painting on the fresh plaster. The painter was obliged to work when the, when the, well, before the plaster dried. Now, this means that the plaster could only be applied little by little as the painter worked in terms of uh, what he thought he might finish in a day or before lunch or, or what have you. There's a word in Italian which is called the giornata. We know from the cleaning of the Sistina that uh, the colors are very, very bright and Michelangelo wanted these bright colors. To do that, we see that in certain areas he put on a, at the very end, just before he painted, a very bright white, more white, let's say, very, very, very thin layer of preparation, uh, but very rich in lime, uh, very thin. It would be a, a millimeter or two thick, what he's putting on now, like a sheet of paper. After the plaster is applied, the design is transferred using cartoons, drawings on paper. The contours of the figure are incised into the wet plaster, sometimes using a piece of wood. A different technique is used to outline the details around the face. The other technique is called spolvero in Italian and uh, probably called uh, a pouncing technique in English. We make a series of small holes along the lines in certain very key points. Uh, Michelangelo, we see, did the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears, the throat. And uh, then takes a little sack of uh, charcoal or some powdered pigment. And then you'll see the pigment goes through the holes and leaves the design on the fresco. So he has something to use as a guide for painting. You see, that would be how Michelangelo transferred his design. And with that, it gives you a base for painting. Michelangelo mixed ground pigments with water. He used just seven colors derived from minerals found in earthen clays. For his greens, he used green earth, ochres for his yellows and reds, and cobalt or lapis lazuli for the blues. When Michelangelo applied the colors to the wall, they had a translucent quality, like watercolor. But as the plaster dried, a process called carbonation took place. Carbon dioxide in the air combined with the lime in the plaster to form a hardened rock-like surface of calcium carbonate. As a result of this process, the pigment particles were cemented in place, becoming a part of the wall. Standard fresco technique is a rather stable technique. When it's done well, it lasts thousands of years. We have Roman frescoes that are uh, close to 2,000 years old. But did Michelangelo vary the standard technique in any way, embellish it perhaps by adding any other layers of paint or glue varnish to the surface of the fresco? Unfortunately, there is no complete record of Michelangelo's working technique. In letters to his family, he did write about painting the chapel, but he mostly complained of the uncomfortable working conditions. In front, my skin grows loose and long. My head is bent back on my shoulders, and my paintbrush drips a rich mosaic onto my face. Okay. So that's basically the technique. So you can imagine that Diego Rivera drew, painted this mural that's 22 feet high and 74 feet wide by just in little teeny chunks about what you saw them doing there because you can only 
have as much fresh plaster as you can do in, in, you know, in one day's work. And sometimes he would work 12, 14 hours a day to try and get that done. So here, here we see uh, uh, a close-up shot of the Sistine Chapel. So that was, so Michelangelo, who was actually a sculptor, believe it or not, that was his primary thing. Uh, but the Pope asked him to do this uh, fresco. And of course it was a monumental work and it was 60 feet up in the air and there were all kinds of issues. And it was done around, you know, early 1500s. And then of course for 500 years or, or four or 500 years, there was, uh, you know, all the lighting was done with candles and there was smoke going up to the top of the Sistine Chapel. And event, over the years, it just got covered with soot. And then a few years back, <clears throat> they decided to, to clean it, to do a, a conservation on it. And so here we have an example of what it looked like before restoration and then what it looked like after restoration. So you can see this beautiful colors, especially this blue in this woman's, this drape over this woman here, compared to what it looked like here. And people, when that happened, people said, oh my God, you ruined it. It couldn't have been that, it, it couldn't have been that bright. And it's 500 years old. There's something wrong. You guys cheated. You, you went up there and painted it. And that was not true. These are the colors. And that's the one of the things about fresco is those pigments are actually part of the wall. And so they're not, obviously if they're sitting out in the sun, usually these frescoes are either indoors or they're covered over, you know. Uh, if they're not exposed to the sun, they just last and last and last for a long, long time. So that even, you know, when I see that, it just blows my mind that not only was this guy a great artist, he had to design this whole thing, figure it all out. You saw those cartoons, what they call him. He had to figure out a section, draw this whole picture of what he was going to do there and then do it bit by bit by bit. So, I mean, it, it, it's really quite, you know, quite an accomplishment. Okay, so... I'm not going to go into too much details about uh, Diego. As a matter of fact, I see that this this quote is cut off, but that's okay. It's not the it's not the most critical thing. This is a picture of him as a a young man. He was born in Mexico. He had a twin brother. He was a twin, but his twin brother died at a very young age. And uh, by the time he was three years old or so, like a lot of kids, he was like, you know, writing on the walls in the house. And rather than, uh, you know, spank him or something like that, they recognized his talent. So they basically put canvas or coverings around so he could just go and draw. So he was really a prodigy. And I think he went to Europe when he was, well, he, he enrolled in a prestigious art school in Mexico. And then at a relatively young age, I don't know if he was still a teenager, he went to Europe. Now he was born, well, here, let me take up the other picture here. So he was born in, oh, hold on a second here. I think I know what's going on here. I got my picture. There, that's better. He was born in 1886. Well, I think he was about, I think Picasso was about, they were pretty much the same age, maybe within five years of each other. So this was kind of the, you know, post-impressionists, I guess they're called. So there was Brock, there was Picasso. Picasso was kind of doing his cubism thing. Uh, Rivera met him. And they kind of went to each other's studio. And of course he claims that, uh, you know, Picasso stole some of his ideas and probably Picasso said the same thing about him. That's the way artists were. But he was kind of hanging out with that group. 
they were sort of, you know, they were kind of sort of bohem uh, bohemians, you know, in Paris during the uh, turn of the 20th century. So in the 30s, of course, during the, this is during the Depression, Rivera came to America and he, under a commission, he painted 27 fresco panels entitled Detroit Industry on the walls of the inner courts at the Detroit Institute of Art. So that is really the big collection of his murals in the United States. He also painted, <coughs> He also painted a mural in Rockefeller Center. Uh, if you saw the movie Frida, you probably saw that whole story. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that that mural, he had a falling out with the Rockefellers, and they they tore that mural down. And he went back to Mexico, basically recreated it in Mexico. And as I've mentioned before, in 1940, he came to this to the Golden Gate International Exposition. And that's where he created this mural. So this is big, this is basically an overview of the mural. It was created on 10 robust steel frame panels bolted together and weighing about 21 tons. And it was designed to be portable so they could move it to the college campus. And here we have the first panel. So I'm going to try and make it as big as I can, but so you can still see it. And I'm going to try to I got a little thing here called a spotlight, but I don't know. Can you see this little red dot moving around on the screen? Okay, so that's what I'm going to use kind of as my, my pointer. I think I'm going to, let's see if I can scroll down a little bit. Yeah, okay. So I can scroll up and down here a bit. So up here in the background, we have the, uh, you know, excuse the two me, fame. Excuse me, Fred, can you make the images larger on the screen? Like full screen for... For us well, to see better. yeah, unfortunately, you know, they're in vertical mode. No. So well, I can are, make they full, are they full screen? Are you well, able to make full screen? Well, they're in full screen. It's in full screen right now. Okay. I mean, I can make it bigger. Hold on. Use your zoom in the top left. I know that's what I'm doing. You there should you be you should be able to zoom up on your screen. If you go over to the right up there, it'll say view options or something, and you can size it up because everybody's got a different size screen. Oh, See if okay. you could. Yeah, yeah, actually, I did. I just did um, standard, and that came out better than what it was in before. Okay, so you can play around with it and see what works for your screen. All right, thanks. So. So basically, this mural was about, you know, Pan Amer it's called Pan American Unity in English. And uh, this was right before the war. The, well, it's 1940. So the Second World War was already in progress. And so this, that's what this mural was all about. So Diego, he starts out here. He doesn't show, at that time, sort of modern Mexico. And the reason, one of the reasons is that Mexico had a, after, had, had had a, a dictatorship for almost 30 years with uh, Porfirio Diaz. And he was not always so popular, especially among the group that uh, Diego hung out with. So what he did, he reverted to the indigenous people of Mexico to show that, show them. And that's what we're basically seeing here. We see in the background, we see the, the two famous volcanoes. Here we see a picture of, uh, uh, I always get, I get Tenochtitlan mixed up with, with the pyramids that are outside of Mexico City. But the original 
the original city in the lake in Mexico City. And then here we have uh, a priest around uh, people preaching. This one, this is, these are actually the, the deer dancers from, uh, from a different prov province of Mexico state, but he throws them in there because it's kind of lively looking. And uh, we see people doing kind of making art here, pottery and drawings and using instruments. And here we see uh, people incising on these stellas doing sculpture. And then here we have this uh, little dog that <laughs> was, uh, Rivera had a dog, it's called a Zolotl, which is a breed developed by the Aztecs. And so he threw in a picture of his, his dog there. And then here's the bottom, the bottom part of this panel. Here on the left is one of the early uh, kings of uh, the Aztec Empire. And the, the word, the myth was that he developed some bat kind of wings that was, he thought he would be able to fly with. So you see a picture of a bat here and you see his kind of device. And then here he shows uh, these craftsmen doing, uh, Wet, lost wax casting. So if you're familiar with that technique, you basically uh, make, a, make something out of wax and then you basically cover it with clay, then you burn out the wax and then you pour in the gold. And that's what's going on here. They're, you can see here they're heating it up by blowing into this furnace to get the temperature up to, to melt the gold. So that's basically the, the first panel. Here we have the second panel. Let's see if I can scroll down here. So this woman, the diver, you see it's, she's pretty predominant in this picture. Her name was uh, Helen Krenlo Krolinkovic. And she was the 1939 national diving champion. And she was a, gonna be on the 1940 Olympic team member. And she had, uh, she was from, San, she would lived in San Francisco. And I think she maybe even attended the city college. And she was quite famous at the time. So he chose to put her there in her diving. And here in the background, we see the Bay, Bay Bridge the city of San Francisco. Over here, he built some, he showed some buildings that just happened to be built by the architect who really was his, who commissioned this work. So Rivera was not above doing that, you know, quite often if somebody commissioned a piece, you could almost be sure that they would probably show up someplace in his murals. Here we have a fellow who's carving the Quetzalcoatl, which was the kind of mythic animal in uh, Aztec mythology. And you see the colors going out behind them. We actually saw it in the first panel also. And he also, the thing he always did, he almost always appears somewhere in his frescoes. Here he is painting. He was a big guy. He was like over six foot tall, but he weighed 300 pounds. So he was quite a large guy. And when you see him next to little Frida Kahlo, I mean, it's kind of, they're sort of an odd couple because he's giant compared to her. And again, you see people doing artistic work here, clay and things of that nature, basket weaving and making other sort of crafts and stuff like that. And then here, because we're talking about Pan-American unity, he doesn't, he doesn't throw in, most of these people are Mexicans and Americans, but he does throw in Simon Bolivar, who was kind of the liberator of South America, Venezuela in particular. Next to him is uh, Allende, 
not Allende, I'm sorry, Hidalgo. And he was the, he was a priest in the nearby town, of, which is now called Dolores Hidalgo. And he actually led the first revolution against Spain in 1810. That cry of what they called the Grito, Viva Mexico, uh, was first sounded in San Miguel de Allende, which made it become a famous town. And he marched with his parishioners from Dolores with pitchforks and you know not much. And they basically came to San Miguel, and there was a there was a you know soldiers were there, Sp uh, Spanish soldiers or soldiers of the Mexican government but they basically took over the town. But later he and some of the other insurgentes, they call them the insurgents, were captured and killed. But it was the beginning of that Mexican revolution. Next to him is the, uh, the uh, this is uh, Morelos. And he was a priest too, but he also was a soldier and he led the led forces during the, that, that uh, independence of the 1910, basically a civil war. Of course, we all know George Washington. Here's Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. And this is John Brown, who was famous because he was the famous uh, abolitionist who basically, uh, well, they wound up killing him. He was at Harper's Ferry and he was gonna do a big thing there to uh, try and you know, end slavery. And he was a hero uh, among the abolitionists. And we have this next panel here. So let's see if I can <coughs> zoom down here. So here we have this. We 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 really. <clears throat> if you if you have see, if you've seen any of the if you've seen any of the works in Detroit, you'll recognize this thing that Rivera he liked all this mechanical stuff, and he was also remember during this period of the early 1900s, the Revol Russian Revolution took place, the Mexican Revolution took place. A lot of that was about working men getting their freedom from these suppressors. And it was also the same time where there was the, the, the industrial revolution was taking place. So it was kind of symbol of that. I mean, the hammer and the sickle and all that sort of stuff from Russia was kind of all about, you know, working men. And so here we have sort of a combination on the left of a, one of the Aztec deities and then sort of melding into the new modern industrial technology. Here we have a carving and uh, this was a, a wood sculpture and it's a bighorn mountain ram and the guy who was carving his name was Dudley Carter. And it just so happens that their mascot was the a mountain ram. So this was kind of carving that symbol of the college. And of course, she doesn't need any introduction, but here's Frida and she's got her paints out and she's painting. And I, people say, well, Frida made uh, Rivera famous. Actually, Rivera made Frida famous because she got around mainly because of him. And she was a great artist in her own right. And of course, she's, she since has a cult following. So in some ways, maybe she's more famous and well known than him today. Here we have a picture of uh, Rivera again with Paulette Goddard. And she was uh, married to Charlie Chaplin and we'll see Charlie Chaplin later. And I was just reading a biography and they actually, the two of them sort of made some kind of a trip in Mexico. So we don't know the whole 
story because Diego was a well-known womanizer. We know, we know that. And that's why he was married a number of times and he and Frida were divorced and got married again. He had an affair with her sister and um, there was all kinds of uh, issues that they had. Here we see, again, these are some of the people that are sort of played into the, you know, the picture. I don't want to go and identify all these people, but he always puts pictures of people in there that either were part of the commission or his helpers or his assistants. He would always manage to put them inside of a picture. And even though he wasn't, uh, he wasn't that much, he wasn't all that political, like, uh, some of the other uh, uh, some of the other muralists of the time, Siqueiros and a few others, they really had their their murals really had political ramifications. So this is a little flavor of that. Keep in mind it's 1940, so you see a picture here of Mussolini and Hitler <coughs> and Stalin. It's got a little bit, he's got an ax here that has blood on it. And it turns out that Trotsky, who fled Russia because Stalin was on his tail and they were competing for leadership, Trotsky wound up going to Mexico and actually was friends with Frida and, and Diego. And th they actually got him a place to stay and he knew that the, that the Stalin's men were looking for him. And eventually he was killed by one of Stalin's agents with an ice ax. And so Diego throws this in here as kind of a little, you know, poke at him. And of course, here we see, you know, the hand, the hand of America fighting the fist of the of the dictators, the American flag draped over, and we see down here we see uh, uh, what's his name, famous uh, Edward G. Robinson down here and he he was in a scene from the 1940 film Confessions of a Nazi Spy. So he throws him in there. Here's Charlie Chaplin from The Great Dictator. Here we see, I think this is Mussolini over here. Of course, here we see a spoof kind of on Hitler. And we see some other issues here having to do with what's going on in the war, people suffering and dying during the war. And then this last one, see if I can go down here. This is kind of a, an homage to the, to the industrial might of America. This is a time when, you know, they were building dams, Shasta Dam and electrical towers. And we see gold mining here. We see hydraulic mining. We see mining with a pan. Over here, we see sluice mining. Here we see them with someone turning this big wheel to working on some wood. And here we see people carving. This is a big kind of a wine press is what that is used for. So again, it's just kind of a little bit of this might of industrialization of what was going on in America. And then here we have a, a, a an homage to some of the great inventors that spawned this in, in revolution. We have uh, Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, we have uh, Morris, of course, of the Telegraph, and Fulton, who was the, uh, you know, basically the inventor of the, uh, the steam engine, thread steam power, steam power. 
Okay. Oops, I gotta size this down a little bit. Hold on a second here. Oh, went the wrong way. I'm gonna zoom out. And uh, another zoom out. Maybe one more. Oh, I think I've got one that says actual size here. Nope, zoom out. Okay, so this is now up to modern day times. And what's happened, it's kind of been slowed up because of COVID, but the MoMA in San Francisco, they made a deal with the uh, City College that they would like to, they're gonna do a retrospective on Diego Rivera who knows when it's going to happen. Originally, I think it was going to happen this year, but because of COVID, who knows. But the deal they made, they approached the people at uh, San Francisco City College and they said, uh, we would like to take the mural and put it into the area, the, the entrance of the museum where people can see it even from the street without having to come in and buy a ticket. And in exchange for that, we'll do a we'll do a conservation on it. You know, it was made in 1940. It probably needs a little touching up here and there. We'll do that and we'll pay for all of that. And then when it's finished, we'll put it back up at the college. So that's in process. And of course, they're trying to raise money because they're trying to minimize the cost of it, even though MoMA can afford it. Uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of committees formed to, uh, you know, to do all that sort of stuff. And while I'm here, I'll mention, this is kind of hot off the press news. <clears throat> there was another mural that Diego did at the San Francisco Art Institute in 1930. And of course, it's been there for a long time, 1930. That's 10 years before he did this one at the City College. And the San Francisco Art Institute has fallen on hard times. They have big debt. I think that the, the University of California trying to bail them out, but they just got, they have big money issues. And they are, they, there was talk of them selling that mural because their mural is also portable. And there are estimates that it could go for $50 million. And there's, I think George Lucas had showed some interest because he's got his own gallery. So, you know, a guy like he could buy it with his spare change. So that is just, uh, that's current news. And it's called the making of a fresco showing the building of a city. So that's another another mural that uh, Diego did in San Francisco. And that's one of his uh, things. This one's a, maybe it's probably translated from Spanish, but he said, this is a Diego Rivera said, I believe in order to make an American art, a real American art, this will be necessary. This blending of the art of the Indian, the Mexican, the Eskimo, with a kind of urge which makes the machine, the invention in the material side of life, which is also an artistic urge, the same urge primarily, but a different form of expression. <coughs> Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. And uh, let's take like a five minute break. I can have a glass of wine now. <laughs> so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go get a glass of wine, stretch my legs a minute. And in five, I mean, you can, you don't have to go any place, but 
if you want to make a potty break or whatever, it's a good time. So let's take a five minute break and we'll be back in at 6.31. Please don't hit the screen share button until later. This is also a good time if you if you don't want to stick around, you have other things to do, this is a good time to gracefully exit. But if you want to stick around, I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, so I'm back. Um, 
Before we uh, do a q and A, I'm going to uh, put a little plug here in the chat for the Saturday night get together. So if you're familiar with chat, if you're not familiar with chat, down on the bottom of your of your screen, except for people on iPad, there's a little icon that says chat. And when you click on that, it opens up and you'll see uh, people have been talking there and you'll see the foodie film travel Zoom meeting with my email address. So if you're interested in that, you send me an email and I'll put you on the mailing list. But uh, this is also how we communicate quite often in these meetings when uh, you've got some question or some information you wanna pass along, but you don't wanna interrupt what's going on. So here we got right here. About the mural over the uh, that I was talking about. And also in chat, it allows you to send a message, a private message to anybody in the meeting. So normally it says everyone, but if you click on everyone, you can go down and find somebody that you want to send a private message to. So that's kind of, you know, that's good. Sometimes people want, they have, want to have a little conversation or they want to ask somebody, oh, uh, you know, I like your lamp. Where did you buy that or something? And you can send a them lot, a message. Some hosts turn that off. So but you're a nice yes. person. Yeah, sometimes, especially in during presentations or teaching, they turn that off because it gets distracting. I just, I don't know. I don't have it open, so I'm not paying attention to it. So it doesn't, doesn't bother me, but quite often it's, it's, you're not allowed to use it. There's Malgo is with her background, a Diego mural. You're muted Malgo. Unmute yourself. Do you know, do you know what is this mural? Oh yeah, that's the famous one. That's the one that was done for the Rockefellers. Rockefeller and they, Center, right? Yeah. Right here. And, but uh, he, like you said, it, it was recreated at uh, Mexico City at like City Hall or some prominent that, building. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, Diego was kind of a strange bird. I mean, he was a communist of sorts. He belonged to the Communist Party for a while. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it, it was, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't all that political, but. Right, uh, but you know, back then, commu communism was a very progressive. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's ideology. right. That's and right. All those, you know, children of very uh, rich uh, capitalists, like that's Diego, right. Lenin, yeah. Ho Chi Minh, a uh, couple of other, including my dad, when they were young, they were very, very left because it was this really progressive ideology. Yeah, right that's right. And of course, a lot of artists in particular, because they were already sort of leftist anyway, by, right. you know, right. in general. But then he had a falling out because he realized that Stalin was a big dictator. Yeah. And that's Absolutely. when, that's, Absolutely. as a matter of fact, he was kicked out of the Mexican Communist Party because he, he was a Trotskyite. Yeah. He was expelled from the Mexican Communist Party. Later, I think they let him back in, but uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah no, he it, wasn't, it, they, they got their lesson that it's not that idealistic as they thought. Well, that's right. And so, Diego, being a communist and an atheist, 
He was not a, but I mean, one thing about a muralist, they're by commission. Otherwise you don't right. go just, you just don't go paint a mural and then try and sell it. Right. It's all by commission. Right. And only people can do that kind of stuff are people with money and they're usually capitalists. <laughs> so that's how he wound up doing it for Rockefeller. He did it for Ford. Right. Eventually he did it for the Mexican government. Because after the revolution, they had a progressive government and uh, the, the director of education, Vasconcelos, was a very intellectual uh -huh. progressive guy. And he said, you know, we have, a, we have a illiterate population. We should do things that represent the common people and they can relate to that by seeing these murals about, yeah. you know, power to the people. Yeah. Much like they did in Russia, they called Soviet realism in Mexico. Yeah, well, Soviet, Soviet realism was really uh, Stalin's idea. Because after the revolution, after October Revolution, when uh, they killed Tsar and all his, you know, family. Yeah. Um, except Anastasia, nobody knows what happened to her. That's but true. they executed them in Yekaterinburg. And the uh, uh, Soviet Union was uh, the power. They came up with incredible new artistic ideas. So in architecture, the constructivism was uh, very progressive, very modern idea of architecture that later was stolen by Le Corbusier, for example, or even the Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, Guggenheim Museum in New York is really based on some uh, master diploma project of woman in Moscow, student, young woman. She did this spiral architecture that was completely new idea. So they were very progressive at the beginning, but little by little, you know, Stalin said, uh-uh. Yeah, and then, then their art became propaganda art. And then the art and architecture was social realism. Yeah, it exactly. was realistic in the shape, but socialism in the messages. So yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so these are interesting times. And yeah, like you say, uh, Diego, you know, he got some fame. And then when he started, uh, like you said, he started getting these commissions and they were always wealthy people. And he, he didn't have any <laughs> yeah. Who yeah. else can give you a commission? <laughs> exactly. So he just kind of bit his tongue a little bit. And and the one, of course, the creation of man or whatever it was called, evolution of man, in a weak moment, let's say, he put a little picture of Lenin in there and the Rockefellers went berserk because yep. they were big anti-communists, conservatives. Yep. And they okay. said, can't you just paint that out? And he said, no, I won't. They said, "Okay, here's your money. Hit the road," and then he left. And they just chisel. They took a jackhammer and chisel oh, right off the wall. That was really big mistake, I, I think, <laughs> because they could cover it up, you know. And yeah, you would have thought they would have covered it up, and if, if nothing but else, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, like you say, to sort of get even, he went back and redid it. In Mexico. In Mexico City, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> that was kind of a sort of an interesting story. It interesting was, story. Yeah. yeah. Great, well th thanks for giving us that information. That was really oh, Thank uh, you for doing this, Fred. This is really awesome. Yeah, and this is not Diego Rivera's greatest mural, I'm sorry, you know. Uh, I showed it because it's interesting because of its size and some other elements of it. But his really great murals are in Detroit and in Mexico City, I would yeah. say. Yeah. 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 So if you get a chance to go, well, you can go online nowadays and just say, you know, show me <laughs> the murals of Diego Rivera and you can see, you can see every, every single piece of his work. But there's lots of there, lots of his work where there's 
you see the political conflict and there's the working man on one side and the capitalists on the other side and you know yeah. telling the whole political story of, right. of what's going on right but during the war <laughs> during the revolution he just conveniently was in Europe and he stayed for 10 years. And when he came back, basically the civil war was over. Oh. And a lot of people, I read that 10% of the population died in that war. That's a hell of a lot. That's a large percentage mm -hmm. of people. So a lot of people were killed in that war. Mm -hmm. And he sort of hung out in Europe. And the irony of it was that his stipend that he got to go there was really money from the porfiriata because they were the ones that were in power before the revolution but he didn't just say uh, oh i'm not going to take any more of your money <laughs> yeah. he, he kept taking their money <laughs> yeah and he didn't he didn't uh you know he didn't he could have said he could have publicized oh i'm opposed to them right. but he knew but he wanted that money to stay in Europe. So yeah. he was, uh, you know, he was pretty good about taking care of himself. <laughs> Always, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like even, you know, when he built this uh, home in Mexico City for Frida and she was already uh, on the wheelchair. Have you seen this house? There, there are no ramps, there are I've stairs. Been, no, I've been in the house a couple of times, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, well, he was an eccentric guy. And I mean, a lot of great artists haven't been speaking Absolutely. of Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. They said he was a really good asshole. <laughs> Architects have a tendency to not be very popular. <laughs> yeah, that's, I th but that's, I, th I think that's really necessary that they cannot be just, you know, a good uh, family man. Like Frank Lloyd Wright had, 11 children when he abandoned his wife and never wow. cared how wow. they're gonna survive. Yeah, I mean, part of it is they're doing what he did. Well, that's right. That's again with Picasso and Rivera, they're just yeah. so obsessed with their art that everything yeah. else falls by the wayside. Yeah, but I think uh, that's 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 the way it has to be, you know, you cannot be just a uh, good husband and father for the exactly. whole life and be a great artist that yeah. doesn't work that way. Yeah, and like Picasso was in the zone like every waking hour practically of his life. Right. He was, you know, if he was in a bar someplace getting drunk, he was uh, drawing pictures on a napkin or right. something, you know, so, and then he did, you know, and, and he did all kinds of stuff. He did pottery and he had sculpture. I mean, Picasso didn't just do paintings. He did everything. Exactly. Whatever exactly. the mood struck him, he would get stuff and put it together and make art. And what is amazing that he was out of the ordinary. You know, they were really breaking uh, all the standards or the rules. Well, that's right. Yeah, Cubism. And that is and something Brack. that only genius can do, that you can go farther than whatever is uh, in fashion around you. Yeah, and you probably have known, you've heard people say, well, I could paint that. Nah, that's real <laughs> easy to say when you see it. Or, oh, well, he was a lousy painter. He just drew all these squares. Well, if you saw his early works, he could paint. Yeah, his early works style. are perfect when he That's was like right. a teenager. His father portrait is so That's realistic. Right. His father was a tot, exactly. So most of these people, you know, they could do traditional art, but they made it, they wanted to get away from that. Well, that's where the, that's how the Impressionists were. But by the time yeah. Picasso and them came along, Impressionism was kind of fading a little bit. But it was, again, something completely unknown, something new. So was Frank Lloyd Wright. I, I, re, lately, you know, because of pandemic and being locked down, I do a lot of Argentine tango and uh -huh. uh, Astor Piazzolla. That's another example of amazing genius that I he was inventing new sounds something that was never heard before. But also, you know, he had to put his family 
That's right. Yeah. I, have an, I have an Astor Piazzolla story. So many, many years ago, I'm riding on a train. I'm going, uh, I'm going from Italy. I'm going to, uh, to Switzerland. I'm going to uh, Zurich. And I'm sitting on the train, with, you know, chit-chatting with somebody, this fellow. You know, we get to talking where you're going. I'm going, you know, I'm going to Zurich. He says, oh, yeah, I'm going there, too. You know, why you're going there? I said, well, I have a friend there. He says, well, I'm going there because Astor Piazzolla is going to be performing. And he yeah. said, I am a music critic. So it's my job to go there. And I got an extra ticket. Do you want to go? Oh, wow. <laughs> so I got to see Astor Piazzolla. Why? What, is, what was what was the year? Must have been in the eighties, probably. Like in the eighties, awesome. Like because that. he lived in Paris for like ten years. Well, they brought him back to Buenos Aires when he was unconscious. He was dying. Well, when I I spent a couple of months in Buenos Aires, and uh, the woman who I rented a room from, she knew all the ins and outs. She was born there, and there was all kinds of the orchestras would play and there were, you know, these things where you could go for free. It was done by the government. She knew all the angles. So she would just take me along with her. And one time we went to see the, the, the local symphony playing. And they had this young boy there, young kid, young kid there, who they say he's going to be the new Piazzolla. And of course he was the featured accordion player and stuff and he was really Bande good bandillon bandillon is called in yeah. spanish yeah yeah in english we sort of like an accordion it's not really no no it's a different instrument yeah. it's, it's a smaller one we just don't have an english word for it right it's bandillon. <laughs> yeah bandillon but he was playing and there he had a following you could tell this young and he did a lot of solos by himself and everybody was applauding and you know he was kind of the new guy i guess uh -huh. but uh uh -huh. yeah yeah piazzoli he was again a creator of combining like tango and classical and mixing things up and stuff like that absolutely something like a fusion music nothing exactly which had anything. never existed before right exactly yeah but so, so that's that's what is the genius, I think. You cannot be an average guy to be a genius. Exactly. By definition. <laughs> By definition. <laughs> okay, I want to mention that uh, there are, well, I have a, a Diego Rivera bi a biography. I'm sure there's a few of them, but the one I have is by an American Actually, he's, you'll recognize his name because he's well known. He's not with us anymore, Pete Hamill. So you probably heard of Pete Hamill. Anyway, he wrote a biography and it's got it's a lot of nice pictures and it's kind of an interesting story. I haven't read it cover to cover, but uh, he doesn't, uh, there's not much in here about this thing we just talked about because it's a, uh, you know, it's just a very small part of his uh, of his life, but uh, yeah, it's an inter interesting story and some great art for sure. And when I I lived when I lived in San Miguel, there at the Bayas Artes, which if you're familiar with Mexican history, during that same revolution of eight, 1910. The revolution basically was against uh, the dictator and the, the wealth, the aristocrats and the church that had all the power and all the money. And yep. of course, everybody else was poor. Right. And uh, so, uh, Siqueiros, which was one of, was, was a Rivera's contemporaries, he was, he started on a mural. He was going to do a mural in Bayas Artes. Well, Bayas Artes had been a monastery, uh, you know, a nunnery, actually, I think. And that's what happened during the revolution of 19, the 1910 revolution, basically. They were so, un, the people were so had it with the church and their power 
that they took everything away from the church, including the churches themselves. And then they took everything that wasn't the actual church, like you say, a nunnery, a monastery, or anything else. And they turned a lot of those into Bellas Artes, art schools. Yeah. For the people, you know, the people could go to. And yeah. yes, place, it's similar to French Revolution that got rid of all the clergy. That's right. The words. Yeah, that was very progressive. <laughs> yeah. And the, and then they said, you know what? We're going to let you use those churches, but that's it. And they made a law that religious people could not walk out on the street in wearing their religious garb. And they only changed that just in recent years, in the last 20 years or so. A priest so could go walk allowed. around. Now, now, like priests can walk in their... Uh... Yeah, they can walk wearing their collar and stuff, but for a long time they could not. So oh, they wow. really put their finger on the church because they were not happy with the church's power. And the place that I was associated with when I was in San Miguel, it was called the... It was called the Biblioteca Publica. It wasn't really a public government library. It was actually like a, a, a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And the place where it was, was right behind the Santa Ana, Santana Church. And it was, uh, it was a convent originally. Mm -hmm. And then after the revolution, it fell in disrepair. And for a while, it was like the slaughterhouse. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, they, mm -hmm. they really desecrated it. And then it was just nothing for years and years. And then some, some people came along and just wanted to make this as kind of like a, a cultural center mm -hmm. as a live starting out as a library. And of course, then when I got there, I'd already been there for 50, 50 years or something like that. And, uh, so that's what happened. A lot of those uh, buildings connected to churches became government built. Yeah, government buildings basically, or art centers, or public centers, or community centers, and you know, things. So, like but the latest change when you're saying that they reversed that law that you know religion is your not public but private thing. You know, they weren't. You know, they they reversed that law. That that doesn't sound good. Well, I mean, I, th I think, you know, if you talk to most Mexicans or people that study the culture, it's mainly, uh, you know, old ladies, particularly widows that go to the church. Most of the people don't spend a lot of time going to church. I mean, considering how many people there are in Mexico. Well, I, th I think this is still one of very few country where Catholicism is uh, like 90% of the population. Like well, I mean, that's, dying. It, yeah. It's, that's kind of, it's kind of like when you go around the US and you ask people, what religion are you? They either say they're Protestant or they're Catholics, but that doesn't mean they attend church. Doesn't mean that, but in Mexico, I think they do. That's what I think. Well, I think it's mostly the women rather than yeah. The men don't do it too much, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was going to say something else about that too. Now, I, hmm, maybe it'll come back to me. But uh, yeah. But Mexico, so, I think they they still in in the official name they are like state of revolution since 100 years. I mean, government well, after government is the revolution, <laughs> continuing revolution. Well, I think since, you know, after the revolution, the party in power, which eventually came into power, became the P, the PRI, which was means, revol you know, party, partido revolucionario, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. So, but then it, you know, then it just sort of went, it, again, it, like most governments, it became corrupt. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then eventually the conservatives came to power. The PAN, which is a big conservative party. And so then they, they were in power. Mm -hmm. They were in a party. And now I think it's back to the progressives are back in party. And I, I don't know, I haven't been keeping up, but I don't think the, the new, uh, new president is very 
all that popular. I think he made some promises that he wasn't able to keep. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I haven't been, I haven't kept up with that sort of stuff, but you know, good Gotari. I mean, he, he, you know, he, he went in exile to like Ireland or someplace. He stole so mm -hmm. much money. He had to go mm -hmm. someplace where they couldn't, uh, they couldn't uh, send him back to Mexico. So yeah, it's an ongoing problem. Not that the U.S. is much better. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, okay. Anybody else got uh, comments? I mean, we kind of got off on a on a rant there, but it was interesting to talk about that stuff. All right. Okay. I don't see anybody. You're saying goodbye or you're saying hello, Renee? I'm saying thank you, Fred. Okay, well, thank you for coming. I counted the, the top, the most I saw was 46 people. Wow, wow. I think that's the record, Fred. Wow. Congratulations. Wow. That's really something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you guys are the ones that made it happen. I have a, so. a short, a little story. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So my firstborn, my son, is also named Diego because Diego oh. is old Spanish for James and my grandfather was James. So our, my son is named Diego. And when he was about five years old, he's, he's now a professor at a university in, in Seattle. So many years ago, uh, he was five years old and his father was anxious for him to be able to write his first name before he went to kindergarten. So all summer he practiced and practiced. And just before school was to start, we lived in Northern California uh, in Placerville between Sacramento and Lake Tahoe. Um, I, uh, my mother and I took my son, her grandson to San Francisco to the Diego Rivera exhibition at the Mexican Museum that uh, at that time was located down near the wharf because I wanted my son Diego to see the great works of Diego Rivera. Well, he was five. He couldn't have cared less. So when I, so he walks up to one of the paintings and I'm sitting in a room adjacent. I can see him, but I'm watching a video to learn more about Diego Rivera. And my son walks up to this huge picture. He has no idea what the picture's of, but he sees something in the bottom right-hand corner that catches his eye. So he goes up to the painting, he takes his finger and he traces the letters, D-I-E-G-O, because it was his name. The guard about had a heart attack. <laughs> and the guard chewed me out, saying, don't you understand? This is a painting worth thousands and thousands of dollars. You can't touch it. And I'm thinking, he's a five-year-old boy who sees his name. He doesn't, anyway. So I, I, it's one of my favorite memories of his that childhood, is, great... is the image of my son standing there tracing Diego Rivera's name, or Diego anyway, yeah. So that is, that is a great Thank story. You. Did did you name your son Diego because of Diego Rivera? No, no, because it's it's old Spanish for James. James, I know. So there was no San connection Diego with Saint Diego James, Rivera. Santiago. Okay. No, okay. not at all. My <laughs> his father is Mexican American, and so we we wanted oh, a name okay. that reflected yeah. both, you know. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. culture and, and my grandfather. So right, yeah. no, make, makes sense. Right. But uh, what's interesting is his my son's name is Diego Luna, which is the same name as a very popular Mexican uh, actor, Diego Luna. So that's another story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's anyway. a great story. Yeah. All right. Okay. They mentioned okay. in the chat. Uh, I just finished reading Barbara Kingsolver's novel Lacuna which a good part of it is historical fiction that incorporates Diego Rivera, Frida, uh, the protagonist, and Trotsky, and with a fair amount of historical information in there. Um, it's a lengthy novel. Yeah, I, I heard about that recently myself. Yeah, Lacuna, it's a, as you said, it's a historical novel. Yeah. How many people saw the movie Frida? Well, that's worth seeing. Yes. You know, of course, it's Hollywood, but still, you get a you get a feel for what was going on from yeah. it. 
yeah. not so much about his painting, but it's mostly about the relationship between right. Diego and Frida, more or less. Right. Yeah. Right. He also had a little affair with Trotsky as well. Probably That's show right. Up, probably yeah. show up Diego. Yeah, and a number of women. Yep. And uh, apparently the, uh, the uh, Frida and, and Diego switched from um, Trotskyism to Stalinism later on. Um, in fact, there, there are questions as to whether they were involved with his murder. So it mm -hmm. doesn't sound like they were. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, really? She also cross-dressed occasionally. They show that in the movie, flash, actually, yeah. of her showing up in a suit. And there's actually photographs of her uh, dressed up in a suit also. So yeah. they were an interesting couple, for sure. Of course, sure. very much. Yeah. yeah, very, very colorful. Yeah. Very colorful. All righty. Okay, well, I think we'll shut it down. Again, thanks, uh, everybody. Check in the chat if you want to come to the Saturday night uh, foodie film thing. Uh, you can, let's see where it is. Let me see where it, where it get, got buried in the chat. No, it's still in there, so. All right, it's thanks again, Fred, yeah. for the being the, the party of the evening. <laughs> yeah, no, it was really cool. Really, really awesome. Big Thank you so party. much. Thank All right. you. Well, Are you going to do it again next uh, week? Maybe? Party animals always have a better party next week. Yeah, I don't know. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's messy, of course, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know about doing it. Well, maybe I might do something again. Who knows? Sometime. But uh, I'm not going to do it regularly. The uh, Saturday night thing is every Saturday night because right. that's, I don't have to prepare much for that. I show usually show a movie and yeah. then we discuss it and or mm -hmm. people hang around and sometimes it goes on late into the night if people are there and having a good time. So well, All right. you so have you well. chosen this Saturday night's movie? I haven't, but I'm leaning toward Tom Popo, which is a famous uh, ah, nice. Japanese food, move, food film. So the first... So should we all be eating noodles? <laughs> yeah, get your noodles ready, because after you see that, noodles you're going to want to have... And yeah, you're going to... You're going, yeah, you're going to want to have ramen after you see Tom Popo. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're if you're ever in uh, the western if you're ever in the western side of San Francisco, there's a Tom Popo ramen restaurant that's very good. That uh, it's in the uh, across the street from Japantown. I was just going to say, I used to go to Japantown, the place where they had the buckwheat noodles, homemade buckwheat noodles in the mm -hmm. old days, but. I'll have to check that out because uh, I did not know that uh, there was a Tom Popo Rama, and that's great. That's a great story. It's it's on the it's across the street from um, or down the street from the oldest Japanese bakery, and also a really wonderful um, origami paper store. So I think it's Bush. I think it's off of Bush. Anyway. Yeah, there's also a great Japanese paper store in Santa, in Santa, uh, Santa Monica at the Bergamot, Bergamo Station, it's called. They have a great paper shop there, or they used to anyway. Okay. Is this Cynthia? I see Sai iPad who just came in but and left. <laughs> okay, well, maybe they came to the wrong place. <laughs> All right, well, then we're going to wrap it up and uh, yeah, we'll see what we're going to, we may or have something in the future. Uh, okay, all right. Maybe we can like cooperate or something. So it's not always you because it is yeah. a lot of work. Of well, I mean, all you have to do is, uh, well, contact me and I can, okay. I can yeah. give, I can pass your name on to Renee. Maybe we can figure out something. Okay, that's because that's awesome. Ren so yeah, because today. they're look because 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 Servas is looking for people to do programs. 
I would it doesn't have to, to be what I regular, did. It could, regular it could, art or culture show, right. yeah. Yeah. She said, Definitely. nice to see country. Okay. okay. So if you have something that interests you, you could do a presentation, and uh, I'm sure they would be uh, Just happy tell to have you. What you would like to do. In Margo, what kind of dance did you say you do? Argentine tango. It was uh, oh, about do a presentation on Argentine tango. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, teach us all. And, you know, I'm just the beginner now. <laughs> I have other things that I'm better than Argentine tango. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, maybe somebody better than me can do Argentine tango. It's really awesome. I love it. I'm completely mesmerized by Argentine tango. Then you uh, should tell us about it. You don't have yeah. to. Yeah, you could, yeah, just tell us the story for us that, uh, you know, have limited knowledge about it. You could just tell oh, us the story. You know, and that's you could show, yeah, and you I could can, show, you could show I videos can. of great famous dancers and what they were doing and their motives. Oh, yeah, no, this is really spectacular. This is an idea. And, you know, I have great teachers. They are both retired uh, academia professors, but now they huh. all they do is Argentine tango. And so I talked to them, maybe they could do something. Oh, that that would be great. great. No, up on the... Uh, I would come to that. I would love that. Argentine or, is a, tango. or is quite okay. a dancer himself. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Fred. Appreciate that. It was very interesting. Okay, thank you for coming. Hope to see yeah. you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Just a minute. Yeah. And Fred, did you see our little oh, doggy? <laughs> so cute. What a face. He was raptured. <laughs> <laughs> see you soon. Thank okay. you. Okay, well, thank you all. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye, Fred. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.